<laughs> I was muted there because the live stream um, indicator was over the top of my unmute button. So I thought for a minute you might have to have sign language this evening. <laughs> So welcome back after probably what felt like a long afternoon, maybe. I don't know. Did it feel long for anyone? Or sufficient enough time? Great. I'm getting some signs that some of you had a good rest, which was the whole idea really behind having a long break, uh, just so that you really can look after your body and make sure that your mind is fresh and, and willing rather than pushing it into the meditation. So this evening we're going to talk about the theme of joy, um, which is another way of talking about happiness or bliss or uh, pleasure, if you like. Things that perhaps people aren't necessarily familiar with hearing in Buddhism, because of course, the teaching that most of us come into contact with and hear, first of all, are the Four Noble Truths. And the way that those Four Noble Truths are framed is in terms of suffering, suffering and its cause. and the way to end that suffering and the cause of suffering. But the Buddha's path is essentially a happy path. And it's not only a happy path in where it leads to, but with every step we take on that path, it's, it's like a gradual training in happiness and a gradual refinement of the purity of that happiness. Yeah, so the Buddha points out where we suffer, but he does that to activate this wish in ourselves to free ourselves of suffering. And then very compassionately, he points out a different path, a path towards joy. So the two are not separate. It's not that we deny the suffering and then, you know, and only accept happiness or try to transcend the suffering prematurely. Ajahn Chah has a nice quote, and he talks about um, two kinds of suffering. He said, there's the suffering which leads to more suffering and the suffering that actually leads to happiness. So what are those two types of suffering? He says, the first is the pain of grasping after fleeting pleasures and aversion for the unpleasant, the continued struggle of most people day after day. Right? We all know that suffering, not wanting the suffering, trying to get the happiness, basically arguing with reality. The second type of suffering comes when you allow yourself to feel fully the constant change of experience, pleasure, pain, joy, and anger, without fear or withdrawal. The suffering of our experience then leads to inner fearlessness and peace. So this quote doesn't mean that we indulge in those emotions. It doesn't mean that we actually express anger and, and spread our misery around, but he's talking about um, our inner journey, you know, and the path towards fully experiencing um, those emotions within ourselves without fear or withdrawal. So understanding that they are conditioned, that they arise due to various causes, and the freedom from those um, emotions, especially the unwholesome emotions, is by not adding suffering to them, the suffering of denial or rejection or, or craving. And you'll notice there that he's also saying we have to fully experience the joy, we fully experience the happiness, the pleasure. And I think in many um, religions, this isn't really appreciated. Sometimes there's a fear, almost a suspicion of pleasure. Yeah. I think there's a quote, I can't remember who told this, but they said that Orthodox Christianity, and it's probably a bit unfair to Christians because this could apply to any religion, is the fear that somebody somewhere is enjoying themselves. <laughs> but it's actually not so, uh, it's not as wacky as it sounds because I've noticed for myself that, you know, in the beginning in my practice, I used to think that practice was mostly about maintaining a kind of balance a sort of equanimity that was a little bit aloof even detached from experience and that if pleasure arose my main job was to notice that it was impermanent and to allow it to pass I never really learned to accept and open and embrace that happiness because that wasn't uh, the teaching in that particular tradition but with the path into samadhi and that starts, you know, with the gradual training, starting with sila, the practice of virtue. Happiness is a really important um, 
quality to develop. And of course, this is the right happiness, the wholesome happiness that is not based on the senses. And as such, that can actually be an antidote to sorrow, despair, um, frustration that can come from indulging in sensuality. Because sensuality can never really satisfy. You know, the Buddha actually says it's, the, um, it's a coarse, slow and ennoble and unbeneficial kind of happiness. Because it doesn't lead to peace. It doesn't lead to direct knowledge, enlightenment or Nibbana. He says it's a pursuit of enjoyment that leads to suffering vexation, despair and fever, and it's not to be pursued, developed or cultivated. So here he's not saying that it's, you know, we shouldn't have any kind of um, pleasure coming from the senses. I think it's important to make the distinction between the kind of ordinary, fairly harmless daily pleasures of things like enjoying nature or enjoying time with a friend, maybe even enjoying a hot bath. You know, somebody was asking earlier about if self-care is, um, is indulgence and how to tell the difference when the defilements are involved. But sometimes, you know, just caring for ourselves can help relax our body and mind so that we are more ready, more prepared to actually sit to practice. So these kind of pleasures are not, um, you know, going to sort of take you to any kind of hell realm, but the Buddha did say they're not to be pursued, developed and cultivated. So we don't continuously pursue and, um, and roll in those kind of pleasures because ultimately we'll never be satisfied through that direction, through looking in those places. I mean, obviously the sensual pleasures are very impermanent, you know, the senses themselves are impermanent. And the problem is we can become dependent on those happinesses through the senses, the more that we um, seek refuge in those places. The other thing is that there's this law of diminishing returns. So the holiday you had last year, maybe in Wales, and it, perhaps it was sunny and it was really lovely, wasn't quite enough this year. So you've had that experience. So this year you want to go on a cruise to the Bahamas, but then you go on your cruise to the Bahamas and the next year you need something even more exciting, right? Because it just doesn't give you that hit anymore. And the thing with the sensual pleasure is that it drains our energy. You know, it takes energy up. Mostly it's coming from a sense of self. Um, so, <clears throat> so it's not a lasting source of peace. So in the uh, Arana Vibhanga Sutta, which is one of my favorites, it's 139 in the Majjhima Nikaya, the Buddha says that we should know um, how to define pleasure and knowing that pursue the pleasure within oneself. And it's here that he describes the pleasure of the senses in those ways that I've just mentioned. And he said, they are one of the two extremes, they're not to be followed. But the other kind of pleasure is the pleasure of deep meditation and specifically here, the four jhanas. And he actually describes those jhanas as being the middle way. Yeah, so it's not even that the jhanas are somewhere between self-mortification and sensual pleasure. It's not that they're the middle way in terms of some kind of bland, um, sort of equanimous, kind of okay type of state. The middle way is actually looking in a completely different direction. It's not somewhere between the two extremes. It's looking inward, completely away from those extremes which are part of the sensual world. Yeah, so this is what he means when he said, pursue the pleasure within ourselves, And he said that those kind of pleasures are not to be feared. Yeah, and they are to be pursued and cultivated. And then he goes on to describe them. He said that they're quite secluded from sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. And he described them as the bliss of renunciation, paviveka sukha, which literally means, uh, sorry, um, bliss of renunciation is nekama sukha, so the bliss of having let go of so much other stuff, obviously desires and cravings caught up in that sensual world. And then he said it's the bliss of paviveka, that means seclusion, but pa is an intensifier, so it means fully secluded, not only from the sensuality, but from the world of the five senses. He said it's upasama sukha, the bliss of peace. And even went so far to say that it's sambodhi sukha, the bliss of enlightenment. 
because even though the jhanas aren't enlightenment themselves, the bliss that you experience in those states is comparable to the bliss of a mind completely free, at least temporarily in this case, from the five hindrances. And the bliss comes because of all that energy, all that purity that is available now, that the five hindrances are not um, obscuring the mind. So clearly the Buddha is encouraging this kind of happiness. And even if, you know, we feel that these jhanas may be some distance away, it's important to note that the gradual training is a gradual um, development of wholesome happiness. It's called niramisa sukha, yeah, as opposed to amisa sukha, which means a kind of impure happiness. So it's a gradual development and it starts, as I said, with the virtue. And virtue is a really beautiful thing to start developing, especially when we start looking at the positive aspects of virtue. Not only that I should not kill or I, you know, refrain from killing, refrain from stealing, refrain from stealing, etc. We can actually look at the opposites. So instead of only not killing, how can I give life? How can I support life, protect life? Yeah. Instead of stealing or taking what's not given or expecting what's not given, we think about what we can give. Maybe we're not well off financially, but what can we give of our heart? What can we give in terms of time to another, friendship, trust? And yeah, the gift of uh, trust and loyalty by not engaging in sexual misconduct, you're giving a gift to your partner and to other people's partners who you then abstain from adultery with. Yeah, and, and the speech precept, this is a really beautiful one because there's so much uh, harm we can do through speech and also we can bring about so much harmony and peace. And the Buddha said we should speak words that go to the heart, that uplift, that bring happiness, that promote concord, that heal divisions. And so you can see that this virtue is not only about our own inner happiness, which he called blameless bliss. It also had a special word, the bliss of blamelessness, but it's also a relational happiness that we can spread through our relationships, through our interactions with others. So our happiness is no longer separate from yours. My happiness is your happiness. You know, and I'm happy when you're happy. The Buddha has also this beautiful sutta. I was just looking at it before I came in this evening, but it would probably deserve a whole other talk. But it's about, um, uh, what's the name of the sutta exactly? The conditions for social harmony. The, yeah, 10 principles of cordiality. And this is also related to virtue. So in here, he's talking about um, how those principles of virtue mainly um, create cordiality, affection, respect, and conduce to harmony, conduce to unity. So of course, virtue is in there. And also being easy to correct, having good friends, having good friends and companions is a principle of cordiality that leads to affection and respect and conduces to unity. I like this one. A person, it says a monk, but let's say a bhikkhuni loves the Dhamma and is pleasing in her assertions, filled with a lofty joy pertaining to the Dhamma and the discipline. Since they love the Dhamma, this is a principle of cordiality that creates affection and respect and conduces to unity. And then it goes on to talk about abandoning the uh, unwholesome qualities and acquiring wholesome qualities. This also conduces to unity. So here we can see how, you know, the first factors of the gradual training, the virtue, which by extension includes wise friendship and being easy to correct, you know, living a simple life, living a life of renunciation, a few wants. These are all aspects of virtue. And also the cultivation of wholesome states, yeah? what's called sense restraint, guarding or training the senses to perceive things in a way that's beneficial to you and to others and that increases happiness and peace. These are not only blisses that we can experience internally, but these are um, trainings that affect the society, the community, the family that we live among and anyone we meet, right? It can be so easy, like I notice it when we come into this room in the evenings. When people come in and they're smiling, I feel so uplifted, I feel elated, you know, I feel like this is a friendly place to be. 
And I'm sure it's the same for you. If I was sitting here and kind of with a scowl, so oh, you should not do this, you should not do that, you're all late again, you know, or just got very, very serious about the practice and went on and on about suffering, then <laughs> I'm not sure that would have the same effect and the same, yeah, encouraging effect. But the Buddha does go further, of course, and he does talk about a kind of joy that is based on wisdom and a kind of joy that's based on specifically understanding suffering. And I think this is something very profound. You know, it's also interesting that it comes later once we've already developed samadhi, because I think what the Buddha's doing very skillfully is making sure we have some kind of inner resource, if you like, a reservoir, an oasis of peace, of um, resilience of uh, stability um, and of well-being within ourselves before we start to take apart conditioned reality yeah so we already have these refuges these places we can go to rest the mind and then from that basis we can actually um, start to understand impermanence change fading away so the sutta that I wanted to just quickly mention is the uh, Majjhima Nikaya 137. And in there, the Buddha talks about um, the joy based on renunciation and on wisdom. And he says that um, when we know impermanence, change, fading and cessation of the sense objects, then we can see with wisdom their impermanence and suffering and joy arises as a result. I probably haven't quoted that completely correctly in his exact words, but basically he's saying that through knowing the change, the fading and cessation of sense objects, which ties into the fourth tetrad of the Anapanasati Sutta, right? So after the jhana, we reflect on the impermanence, on the fading and the cessation of those states. Then we can see with wisdom, the suffering and impermanence of those states or of the five senses, the five candors, the body and mind, joy arises as a consequence. And the quote that comes to mind is this beautiful um, quote by Ajahn Chah, and there's a photo of him, I think Ajahn Brahm keeps it in his room, and he's standing there, I think in Sussex actually, with his hands up, and he's saying, joy at last, to know there's no happiness in the world. And I just find that so beautiful and so moving because it is joyful when we realize that this world can't be a place of lasting happiness. It means that we start directing our energy, our efforts in different areas, in different directions. The Buddha said the whole world is swept away. You know, the world of our own body, the world of our loved one's bodies, it's all swept away said like old age sickness and death are like mountains coming in from four different sides coming in on us you know, we're in the middle where are you going to go when your back's against the wall you have to go inside so these were all encouragements you know not to be freaked out by this but encouragements to really start developing the wholesome happiness and getting a taste for how it feels it's a different taste than the ordinary happiness that we're used to it's much subtler and more refined of course, there's much more I can say about happiness. There's gratitude as a type of happiness, which is a beautiful kind. And um, the development, again, of loving kindness, of sympathetic joy, the joy in others' happiness, the joy rejoicing in other people's success, in other people's goodness and beauty. And in a way, gratitude is almost like doing mudita for ourselves. It's rejoicing in our own goodness, in our own um, success or fortune, you know, the things we have going for us in life. And these are all three sources of happiness that we can bring up, bring to mind. So don't neglect to reflect. <laughs> Very corny. But not only do we practice the virtue, we have to reflect on the virtue. We have to reflect on the goodness of our lives. So these evenings, as I said, are just for short reflections from me. So I'm going to stop there and give us some time to meditate and then some time for Q&A. So I think by now we're all getting into the meditation a little bit more. I know there have been a couple of requests for longer meditations. Uh, we'll probably do about half an hour. 
but I think I'll just start you off with a little reflection and then have a bit more silence. Does that sound good? Yeah, getting some nods. <laughs> Very good. So please make yourself comfortable in your own time. And I am really, really impressed that we have such amazing attendance. You all clearly love the Dhamma. It brings me a lot of delight. I hope it also brings you delight. <laughs> so many other ways you could be spending your time. So closing your eyes. Following the Buddha's advice to pursue that pleasure, that joy that's within oneself. Without looking for the joy, but simply giving it the opportunity to arise. By first relaxing your body. Relaxing your mind. Imagining your body like a tightened up sponge, stiff in places, maybe solidified like a block of ice. And just gently, as you move your awareness through the body, from head to toe or from toe to head, however you prefer. Imagining that sponge expanding. Or that ice block melting down Pouring out any tension, holding. Tightness, anxiety or pain. without pushing them away, but just giving them the space to be there, holding them loosely. Just visitors, not yours not come to stay. And at this stage, you can still make any adjustments if you find that may bring more comfort.
So the invitation this evening is to start the meditation by bringing to mind something in yourself that you really appreciate and value. It could be a quality that you respect in yourself, perhaps your kindness, perseverance, willingness to make mistakes, your courage to feel, Anything that's a very noble, beautiful, praiseworthy quality. It may not have come yet to fulfillment, but that you're willing to cultivate. How does it feel to recognize that beautiful quality within your own heart? You may have a particular incident that comes to mind where you acted with kindness towards someone else. Perhaps you gave comfort to a friend or a pet. Perhaps you've been working hard on the hospital ward. See if you can connect with the essence of your intention, allowing the stress of the day to fade away. But just recognizing your own selflessness, goodness and care. And you allow that to uplift, refresh, energize the mind. If you wish, you can stay with this perception or I invite you now to choose a quality you admire in someone else. A quality you find beautiful, inspiring, worthy of respect.
What's the countenance of this person? Do you sense their inner beauty? Even from their face? Or perhaps if you know them in their presence? Can you recognize the happiness that this brings to their life? And to all those who come in contact with them. Allowing yourself to rejoice in the goodness of their heart, in the goodness of their life. Sensing the feeling, any feeling of uplift, maybe pleasure, tingling, any physical counterpart to those emotions you've just reflected upon, those qualities. Tuning in to the pleasant sensations you experience anywhere in the body. And allowing yourself to delight in that pleasure. That subtle kind of peace. Refreshing the physical body. And relaxing it deeper still. And as the body and the sensations become subtler, calmer, more peaceful, you may start to notice your breathing. It's as though each breath is a gift from the universe. The benevolence of the universe breathing you. And as you breathe out, you're giving a gift, a gift of carbon 
the dioxide to the plants and the trees. Or you can imagine that you breathe in the benevolence of the universe and breathe out metta, loving kindness, gratitude to all beings. Whatever perception works for you, to bring a sense of reverence, delight in the breath. Simply enjoying the breathing. As your perception becomes gradually more simple. Just the knowing of this single part of this breath. Every breath, a gift of life. And a gift from the Buddha, taking you deeper, deeper into the pleasures of the mind.
inclining again and again towards any peace, any pleasure of a quiet, settled mind. Not noticing the imperfections, the thoughts, distractions. But very softly receiving the bliss of peace. So we're coming close to the end of the meditation. If you wish, you can continue. Before you emerge, just take a few moments to express inwardly your appreciation to your body and to your mind. for giving you this opportunity to meditate. Thanking yourself for this moment of peace. And recognizing that the very fact you're here on this retreat is an expression of your own self care, your loving kindness that you do have towards yourself. The loving kindness that you have to others and that motivates your wish to purify the mind.
Really taking in your own goodness. Perhaps breathing in three slightly deeper breaths. Breathing in the goodness, the love of the universe, of all beings. Breathing out joy, love and care. Ooh. For those who wish, you are now invited to for any questions, comments, or even complaints. <laughs> Jen hasn't said that this time. He usually says that. <laughs> but basically, this is your space now to feedback anything you wish. And again, just sending those questions, comments, or hopefully not too many complaints to Anne-Marie, Q&A. Anna-Marie, actually. I'm saying her name wrong. It's Anna-Marie. <laughs> and uh, I'll see what we can do this evening. If you don't have questions, that's also fine. <laughs> You also might need to take a little stretch. I wasn't gonna have a break, but of course, if you do want to go to the loo or whatever else you might need to do, please feel free. You won't miss much. Oh, you're all so still, it's lovely. <laughs> okay. Any one question so far? Okay, um, I'm not going to read out your names. Ajahn Brahm did say, you know, he, he sometimes likes that because he knows some of you, but since I'm the one answering, I can read my name, your name for myself. So just to keep it more confidential for you. So, while meditating, sometimes I forget where I am. Why? how to handle this and what does it mean? Oh, well, it just means that you're letting go a little bit of time and place. I don't think that's a problem at all, as long as you remember where you are when you open your eyes. <laughs> if at that time you still didn't know where you were, then perhaps you were really in a deep meditation, I'm not sure. But I think that's probably a good sign that you are able to let go and you're becoming less aware of your surroundings. I mean, you've noticed that quite often when we um, do the meditation, um, Ajahn Brahm, as well as myself, sometimes get you to imagine you're in a different place. <laughs> he even does this for children. He gets them to imagine sort of floating through the sky and landing in a mystery island somewhere so that they can really just take a break from their usual life. And uh, I think the purpose of that is just to shift the emphasis from the physical world more into the inner world. So it can sometimes be helpful. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, perhaps at the end of your meditation, uh, it might be helpful just to come back into the body, first of all, before you open your eyes and just locate yourself again, you know, in this physical uh, reality. So I find it helpful to ground myself to feel like which parts of the body are against the ground or against the chair and just get that sense of, you know, being a little bit more solid again before coming out of the meditation. So hopefully that's enough on that. But if that continues to be like if that if you feel that's causing problem for you or some anxiety for you, then please do um, ask again. That's fine. 
Okay. Oh, some sweet comments coming in. And the tiny complaint. So we can't only read out the sweet comments. <laughs> so one person's asking for a bit less talking in the meditation. What's other people's thoughts on that? Could we do with a bit more, like nod if you think that we could have less talking. I'm seeing hardly anyone nod. So I guess we try to find some sort of middle way for you all. Um, we're on a retreat with quite a lot of people uh, who haven't done a retreat before and some who haven't done a lot of retreats before. And also um, because there's only really two sessions with myself and Ajahn, which are guided meditations, we wanted to just give a bit of instruction there so that you have the rest of the day, quite a long stretch during the rest of the day to have more silence in your meditation, well, complete silence. Or of course, if you want more guidance, you can still listen to guided meditations that suit you. Um, but yeah, it's good to have that feedback because this evening I was thinking to do uh, a bit more silent space, but the time tends to go very quickly. <laughs> so we'll see how we can go. I think, you know, this morning I also suggested to Ajahn Brahm that we have a slightly longer meditation. So we did try to do that. Um, but it's an interesting experience. I mean, I can't speak for Ajahn, although he has said this, but for myself, it's almost like we don't decide how, how the words come out exactly. We don't really decide in advance what to teach. Sometimes it's as though it's just coming through you. And I do have a sense of trust in that because I think somehow energetically, even though this is a Zoom room, we're sort of picking up on the general vibe and pitching it somewhere in the middle. <laughs> So it could be that for some people, you know, they actually need more talking. So we'll try and do a bit of variety, but sometimes it's not easy to completely control. So, yeah, I would just suggest that you um, enjoy the silent meditation when you have your own free time. And if you really enjoy meditations which are guided but with a lot of um, silence, perhaps you could look for something online you know, where they just start you off with like five minutes, for example, and then, you know, you have the rest of the hour. There's actually quite a bit on the, hmm, I'm not sure if you can get hold of it, but on the BSWA channel, there are some longer meditations by Arjun Brown, 45 minutes, and he starts with 10 minutes of sort of instruction and then about 40 or 45 minutes of silence. So that could be a possibility for you, but I, I'm not sure if that's on the website or only on the personal, uh, only if you have a personal account. Okay. So Rob's asking, how do the four Brahma Viharas relate to the jhanas? So I would really rather Ajahn Brahm ask this, answer this question because he has experience of entering into the jhanas through the Brahma Viharas, or at least, oh, am I allowed to say that? He didn't say that, <laughs> and that is my uh, that is my um, suspicion. Let's say so. I know that he has taken meta meditation very deeply, um, but he tends to you have the nimitta coming up in very much the same way that he would in the breath meditation, and that's the way he normally teaches the jhanas. So, I think for him the difference would be like the quality of the awareness would be slightly more infused with metta. So it would have a particularly blissful feeling because one of the characteristics of metta is the warmth and the pleasantness of that state. So sometimes he talks about the nimitta of the metta jhana being like a golden color. And again, this might be just for him or it might be what he's experienced with other meditators, I can't say. But um, I think for him, it's a similar process um, but for other teachers, yeah, I mean, basically, they do kind of relate quite well to the four jhanas. They, so there is some overlap there because the fourth uh, Brahma Vihara is like equanimity, for example. And in the fourth jhana in general, which is usually accessed through breath meditation, the quality there is also mostly equanimity. That's one of its defining characteristics. So there is some overlap, but then there are other teachers who teach the four Brahma Vihara jhanas slightly differently to the Anapana jhanas, if you like. 
Um, Ajahn Brahm might say that that's, you know, not valid in his experience. He might say that a jhana is a jhana is a jhana. But some people do teach metta jhana more as being absorbed into the feeling of metta. So it's a very, very subtle feeling, but it's a, still not entirely disassociated from the body. And it's that sort of absorption in that feeling of metta that continues for a long time that they classify as first jhana. So as I say, I don't want to sort of say which one's right or not, or, um, you know, make any kind of uh, judgment on that. But there is a relationship there. And you certainly can enter deep jhanas, deep absorptions through the Brahma Viharas, because really what they're doing is working with different hindrances. So the speciality of the metta practice is that it will really help to undermine ill will. So if that's your particular weakness, you might find it easier to move closer to or all the way into an absorption meditation, a jhana meditation through the consistent practice of metta either along with the breath or instead of the breath it can happen yeah so i hope that's not confusing and that's helpful but basically anything that's leading the mind towards deeper and deeper peace and helping the mind to overcome these hindrances is a great practice and you'll go through similar stages on the way Someone's asking, what about dancing and singing? I dance almost every day. Should I stop after the retreat if I want to pursue meditation? <laughs> That's such a sweet question. I don't know, it makes me smile. <laughs> um, no, I don't think there's any reason that you should stop. And for me, um, the precepts for me have been a natural refinement of my verbal and physical conduct. So there's nothing actually ethically wrong with singing and dancing. But for me on my personal path, I always had a very strong kind of inclination towards renunciation, even before reading about the precepts that a renunciate takes. And so even though on the retreats, I would practice eight precepts, after the retreats, I would still sometimes in the early days when I was 20, I did my first retreat. So sometimes for about um, six months, I would still go to the odd full moon party and I could really dance, you know, I could go for it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so I still enjoyed it to a degree. But probably by my second retreat, actually, I just didn't feel the, the inclination anymore. And also I used to sing a lot to all the Led Zeppelin stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and you know I had quite a good voice uh, <laughs> if I wasn't a, a nun I probably would have been a rock star or maybe a psychologist I'm glad I didn't do that nothing against psychologists at all um, but what I'm trying to say I guess is that for me um, these things naturally fell away because I was enjoying more and more the peace of the mind I was enjoying the peace that came through meditation even though it didn't feel very deep just yet I just didn't have that sort of restless energy perhaps that made me want to dance or need to dance or sing so much. Um, so as a lay person, I wouldn't say there's any need to try and stop yourself doing that because as I say, it's not an ethical issue, but you may just find that um, it starts to calm down. You know, you may prefer a different kind of dancing or singing. You may prefer to do some chanting instead. That's all I get to do these days. So, um, so just see what works for you. I mean, for me, singing wasn't helpful to meditation because I've got a very musical mind. And if I even hear any song, even any rubbish song, it sticks in my mind for days, sometimes weeks. And so even with the chanting, actually, if I chant too often, the chanting will go around my head quite a lot. Just the tune of it will carry on and on. So I don't find that very helpful to meditation. And so there's a natural um, movement away from it because I'm moving towards a, a subtler kind of happiness and I'm actually moving away from something that's becoming more like uh, an agitation for me. So I think our perceptions start to change. And once you find that the singing and dancing is more agitating than rewarding, then naturally that will fall away. Oh, and a related question is about uh, 
to do some meta chanting during self practice. That's absolutely fine. Yeah, absolutely. If you want to do some meta chanting, and I would say, you know, if you're going to do that chanting, see if you can uh, learn a little bit what the words mean. I think Melanie, you're usually in our chanting session anyway on a Wednesday, so by now you probably do have a sense for the meaning. And the chants are beautiful. I mean, these are the Buddha's words, or as close as we can get to the Buddha's words. They may be not straight from the suttas, but certainly um, very close. And they are very instructive. You know, they're not just things to make us feel good. They're actually, they contain a lot of meditation instructions, particularly the Karaniya Metta Sutta, I feel. Because it's talking about, you know, the qualities of virtue and all the preparatory um, work that we can do to develop a, a mind of loving kindness. So how does it go? Like, uh, uh, this is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness. Uh, please. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited contented and easily satisfied, not busy with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Yeah, so this is all part of Silo and these, there's certain types of Silo that are very much related to developing loving kindness. And you can also see the relationship there with contentment. Yeah, so the contented mind is happy with little, doesn't demand too much from you or from others. It doesn't demand too much from your own meditation either. Even if you had like part of a breath that was fairly peaceful, where you felt present with it, where you felt, as Ajahn Brown says, that you were holding hands with this little breath. Even that is satisfying, you know, notice it and, and pat yourself on the back. So the mind that is contented, it values what it has. And that means that whatever you have, you feel rich. I mean, the richest people in the world, if they don't appreciate those riches, if they still feel they need more, they're not rich at all. You know, it's as if all those, that wealth is wasted on them. But someone who can be contented just with one simple little breath. Isn't that a wonderful thing? I always remember one of my close friends, she came to stay with me in India for a while while I was studying Pali. I was there for, well, years actually, but at this particular time for a year in a meditation center in India. And uh, it was her 30th birthday and we'd got hold of these tiny little sweets, like one rupee each or something. And she opened up this little boiled sweet and she said, I'm 30 years old and I'm so happy that I can be this contented with one sweet. And I just remember her saying that and the real joy and sincerity in that proclamation it was just delightful <laughs> you know just sitting with a good friend in this wonderful meditation center and enjoying one sweet and I just thought yeah you just don't want anything else in the world we were in such a good place in our lives we were young we had all this time for practice you know it was just couldn't be better so, so yes do some meta chanting why not but if it starts to go around and around your head like it does for me sometimes then you might want to back off. <laughs> oh, someone's saying the quality that came up in meditation was to feel like a queen in an old jumper. <laughs> Not quite sure. <laughs> it's kind, kind of a nice visualization, nice image. In fact, being content with little is a source of joy. Exactly that. It's as though joy is there all the time, but it's not good enough for us. We don't even notice it. The joy is there, but we've never really bothered to look for it. We've never really valued it. You know, we've just moved on to something else because we've got this idea of what we think joy should be or how it should feel. And usually that idea is very close to the sensuality, isn't it? The sensual world. That's what we know. So we're looking for something like that. And, you know, Ajahn Brown sometimes uses this very coarse simile about the bliss better than sex. And in a way, he says it's his advertising slogan, right? Because the jhanas are a bliss better than sex and people get interested when they hear that but actually it's um it's not really an accurate uh comparison because it's something completely different you know so much more refined and peaceful and also i can say from my own less uh, more limited experience than him but it has come to the point where the bliss has been literally mind-blowing 
and it is a very very different kind as I was saying earlier it's um it's much more stable and fulfilling and satisfying for the mind it's incredibly satisfying you know and I could see myself sort of um sometimes almost feeling it was too much and then part of my mind would just withdraw slightly but then it would be pulled back in again because it was just so impossible to resist so yeah but it's a different kind and that happened to me actually one time from a very ordinary state of mind but there wasn't a lot of obvious bliss there was just a little bit of peace and I remember this instruction that Ajahn Brahm gave one time where he said notice bliss and just the word notice bliss came in and suddenly I just saw something that I hadn't noticed like something so subtle and the minute I saw it whoosh it took over in the mind it's so fascinating the way these things work. But of course, if you're looking for it and you want it to happen, it never does. So it's just being very, very subtle, very, very gentle and just literally just opening up to whatever's right there. So. So Suzanne says, thank you for the beautiful meditation. That's nice to hear. I was able to label my admirable quality, but I struggled to feel any admiration for it compared with the gratitude I felt visualizing an admirable quality I see in another. Do you have any advice for how to cultivate feeling as well as knowing when it comes to self-care and kindness? Yeah, I mean, the fact that the reason that I um, asked you to bring up a quality that you value in yourself and then bring up a quality that you value in another is because most of the time it's much easier, especially perhaps for people brought up in cultures where we're trained to see the faults in ourselves. It's much easier for us to um, connect to those beautiful qualities in others than it is towards ourself. And there's this myth with the practice of metta and probably medita as well, that was more like a medita practice, um, that you can't have loving kindness for others unless you have it for yourself. And for a long time, I've thought that can't be right because then people who don't have loving kindness for themselves can't even begin, right? <laughs> that means you can't love anyone else, but you do love other people. I mean, I really love my friends. I really love my teachers and, you know, and yet I'm harder on myself. So actually the two can go hand in hand. You know, you can start from where it's easier. And as you get used to seeing and feeling the, um, the emotion connected with seeing beauty in another, seeing valuable qualities in another, you'll start to get a felt sense of that. And then when you look at it in yourself, you'll realize, oh, actually it's the same quality. You know, it's just the sense of self that comes in and jeopardizes it. That's all, it's actually the same quality. So you'll get a feel for it in another first and then gradually you'll be able to allow it to arise in you as well. So I think that's a really good way to go to practice with both the loved person or the person who's you know, who's not you and then to practice again with yourself there's another teacher he's not a monk but um i quite like what he said about his way of meditating with metta and i guess it could work for mudita as well he starts off by um doing it with a friend so may you be happy may you be peaceful and then he imagines himself with that friend and then he says may we be happy may we be peaceful so he gets the meta going first of all with the easy person and then he includes himself after that so it's like you're sneaking up on meta yeah you're approaching it bit by bit so that the sense of self can't come in and sort of the inner tyrant ah you don't deserve it ah, it's not good for me to feel happy so so yeah i would just say um keep on working with that um you do say that you felt gratitude for the when you were visualizing the admirable quality in the other so obviously the feeling was arising and it will start to arise with your own loving kindness and self-care as well it's just a matter of getting used to it and opening up to it i always remember this retreat in fact it was when i had this very blissful experience and um and i went to one of ajahn's talks and uh, it was in Perth, so he gives the Rains Retreat talks every week. 
and um, it really kind of freaked me because he was talking about patience and I thought he was talking about patience with difficult feelings but then he suddenly said and you have to endure the bliss and you know when somebody says something and it's like speaking right to where you are in that moment it was like woof <laughs> it just hit me because I realized that I wasn't really able to uh, fully open up to it and that sometimes it's uncomfortable yeah sometimes it goes against the grain it goes against our sense of self especially if we think of ourselves as someone who struggles and suffers and is sad or whatever then when we feel the happiness it's actually quite challenging and we have to learn to endure that happiness so getting a taste for a new meal Hmm. So someone's saying that they find it quite hard to meditate without guidance, and I think part of this may be fear. It seems gentler to do it with yourself or Ajahn Brahm or with a group. Can you give any advice on how to gain confidence meditating on my own? So exactly what we are doing, I think, you know, just to continue practicing with myself and Ajahn Brahm, and gaining more and more uh, familiarity, as he was saying this morning, with these states of meditation, with the feelings of meditation, and also the process, how it unfolds. Yeah. And as you gain that confidence, you'll start to realize that when you're alone, it's a similar process. You can imagine that you're there with Ajahn Brahm, if that helps to give you a feeling of safety. You know, as I said yesterday, I sometimes surround myself quite literally with my teachers. And actually, I dreamt of that last night. I was with my first preceptor and Ajahn Brown was also there. And so these kind of perceptions start to come inside. And he said to me something today about, oh, I don't need to do anything because he's already doing it. He's already planting those conditions. And I think this reflection can be really helpful, too. But if you do have that fear coming up and you find it gentler to be guided, you know, respect that as well. I mean, perhaps have some periods where you give yourself some chance to meditate alone, but don't go too far with it. You know, give yourself a limited time initially and gradually build it up. There's no kind of uh, must, you know, you don't have to sit for like one hour or two hours or anything like this. So you can gradually, gradually get used to being by yourself with your own mind and, uh, and not force it too much because a fear can come up and... Um, you know, it needs to be worked with skillfully, I think. So, I mean, if you are meditating and fear comes up really strongly and you feel you're not ready to work with it, then just gently bring yourself out, you know, gently sort of maybe put your hand on your heart and say, it's okay, we're coming out of the meditation now, that, that's good for now, you know. Come back into your body, come back into the room and just have a little break, have a cup of tea, do some walking meditation, maybe, you know, say some phrases of loving kindness towards yourself. I really can't emphasize loving kindness enough. I know some people are saying, is it too much doing, etc. But the thing is, most of the day, you're not in probably very, very deep meditation. There's many times of day when you're busy with other activities. And it's much better to be planting seeds of metta in your mind at those times than to let the thinking just go in its habitual ways, you know, because it's not as though we're not doing anything when we're not cultivating the path. We are. We're always doing something. And most of the time we're cultivating our habitual tendencies. We're following our conditions, which are not necessarily skillful. Right. So try to follow the um, the Buddha's advice and also perhaps yesterday somebody asked about reading and I should have really said it then that you know you can read the suttas this is helpful too yesterday um Ajahn Brahm mentioned one sutta called the uh uh Upakilesa sutta 128 of the Majjhima Nikaya and in there uh the Buddha is actually giving advice to the monks who are having these lights coming into the mind and getting really scared and he goes through all these different um, upakilesas, like um, uh, sort of, what would we call upakilesas? Um, kind of like the remaining defilements. I wouldn't really say subtle because they're still defilements, but they're like the lingering defilements that are sort of hovering around 
preventing you from moving into that jhana experience. And they're things like the fear, the excitement, the anticipation. There's quite a few other qualities written there as well. And sometimes just reading that can help you feel that you're in good company and that this is quite a normal process to be going through. And also that there isn't any rush. You know, these were senior monks. These were monks who went on to become fully enlightened and great, great teachers who we remember today. So they had to go through these things. So who are we to think we don't? So I actually think go with what you do find gentle. There's nothing wrong with that. And then maybe build up during the day to some sessions where you sit alone. I hope that helps. Yeah. Thanks. Nice to see some feedback. Hi, can saying phrases like meta or let it be, let it be, be kind, be kind, be too disturbing to the mind? I find that sometimes trying to say them can create tension. So again, please go with your own experience. You know, only you know whether that's disturbing to your mind or not. If sometimes it is, then it is. So please don't say them. If other times it feels helpful, then try it out. So it's really up to you. You know, there's no right or wrong. And as I said before, different things at different times. So, you know, perhaps you tried it today and you find that your mind was becoming tense, but don't necessarily uh, reject it altogether forevermore because of that. There may be times that, you know, something very difficult or disturbing comes up in the mind and it's helpful to just say, let it be. And you might just need to say it once. And it just nudges the mind in a wholesome direction. Other times you might find that these things just pop into the mind without any effort. And that can be really nice. Like I said, you know, earlier that this phrase notice bliss just popped into my mind one time when it was really helpful and that was enough. So please go with your own intuition. There is really no right or wrong. It's just that in a retreat like this, we try to give lots of different little tips and and uh, tools that you may be able to use according to the job at hand. I've been finding that during meditation, the moment I reach the point on the cusp of stillness, my mind gets excited about being still, then it gets restless straight away. Have you any advice for this, please? Yes, this is one of those upakilesas that's also very common. And it's just a matter of um, training your mind so one really helpful thing that um, Ajahn Brahm teaches, and that is part of the Satipatthana Sutta and the Anapanasati Sutta, it's part of um, establishing mindfulness in the beginning. So his method is to remind yourself in the beginning what your obstacles might be, especially what your usual obstacles tend to be. And you program your mind. You wait until there's a little bit of mindfulness. So you settle the body, settle the mind down a bit. And then you can say to yourself, when I get to that point of stillness, I will not be excited. Or I prefer positive words. When I get to that point of stillness, I will stay calm. Something like that. And you say it once, twice, three times, clearly like an instruction, like you're programming a computer. <laughs> I don't know how you do that, but I guess it's similar. <laughs> uh, I'm actually more scared of computers than I am of my mind. Maybe that's delusion. <laughs> but um, you just put in those instructions in the beginning and you leave it alone. And then you allow the meditation to unfold as it will. And it may be that when you get to that point of stillness, you still get excited and you still get restless. And that's okay, because that's our condition tendency. But then you notice, oh, look, it happened again. And then next time you sit very patiently again, you program your mind. And over time, it starts to chip away at that, um, at that habit. And eventually the stillness and the joy will get so strong that you won't be able to resist it. So it doesn't really matter. I mean, I've been to Ajahn Brown many a time and said, ah, I blew it, you know, <laughs> on that stage. And I thought he was gonna say, oh, you know, da. And he didn't, he just said, oh yeah, you know, one day you won't. <laughs> oh yeah, it'll keep happening and you know, and then, it, and then it won't. And that's how it goes. So 
we have to go through these things, but it's great that you're getting to the point of stillness. It's wonderful. So just enjoy the ride. Remember, it's this um, wanting it to go further that is more of the problem. So perhaps after that meditation, when you feel like, oh, I got restless and excited, just go back in your mind a little bit and appreciate what you just experienced. Yeah. Instead of ending with that feeling of restlessness and excitement, just reflect, oh, I was just had this lovely experience of stillness. Never mind the excitement, never mind the restlessness. Just remember it for a moment and, and take it in, you know, appreciate where you came to. And that will also condition the mind to, to value the beauty of meditation. Uh, okay, so someone's asking, is the delightful breath, the feeling of delight in the breath, is it the same as the feeling during loving kindness meditation? Um, it's similar, but for me, metta has a, its own particular quality and it's a recognizable quality connected to metta, to loving kindness. That could be because when I practice loving kindness, I'm mostly focusing on my chest area because that's where I've been sort of trained to allow those feelings of love to arise. Um, but what I often do is actually practice loving kindness, especially if I'm in a long retreat and I'm sitting, I tend to like to sit for fairly long sessions. So I might do med meta meditation for a whole hour and really get that feeling of loving kindness quite strong. And then I might go to the breath, but it happens quite naturally because after a while the loving kindness is there and the mind wants to be stiller and the words have fallen away. And so naturally you start to feel the breath, but you get a kind of head start in a sense because you already have the PT. So that by the time you go onto the breath, you already have this delightful breath. And it is a bit different. I mean, for me, the delightful breath then becomes um, a little bit more refined. And at first it's probably a bit calmer, maybe a little bit less sweet than the meta. But if you get into more um, delight with the breath and the delight becomes stiller, then it becomes even more powerful than loving kindness in my experience. I mean, I'm just speaking from my own experience here because it will be different for everyone. Um, but sometimes then the bliss and the delight is even purer because it's even less fabricated. It's actually the bliss of not doing, it's the bliss of stillness. And it seems to come from a, deep, a slightly deeper place. So there's a slight difference, but I, I don't know that it really matters. Um, so just see what it's like for yourself. The main thing for you is just to become familiar with these emotions and to be able to recognize them and to recognize that they're wholesome. You know, to recognize that there are um, emotions that arise when the hindrances start to fade. Yeah, that's how you can know that they're purer emotions than your normal emotions when the hindrances are present. <clears throat> okay. So someone says they're struggling with the six hours of free time. Sometimes I feel anxiety because I don't know what to do with all that time. I do some meditation and nap, which usually makes me feel grumpy. I try to accept all the feelings that arise with kindness and that helps somewhat. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I think that um, when we're not used to having a lot of time on our own, it's quite unfamiliar and it's sometimes perhaps a bit challenging because we define ourselves so much by what we do and by being busy. But this is all part of the kind of um, allowing the mind to start unwinding. You know, it's like you're a battery that's been kind of charged, 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 charged up, and the battery's all ready to go and start powering whatever it is it needs to power. And now you've got six hours where it's just left alone and the battery has to start discharging. And sometimes that's a strange feeling because you're used to feeling kind of like, you know, useful or, or busy or whatever it is so but it's actually not a bad thing to have time that you don't know what to do with because then you can start to come in contact with your bodily needs so it seems like you're doing that you're coming in contact with the fact that you need to lie down maybe have a nap I mean if that is making you feel consistently grumpy 
maybe uh, you don't really need a nap. <laughs> but, you know, it's not that you can get it right or wrong. It's an experiment. So just try and take that time to ask yourself, what is the best way to care for myself right now? Sometimes it will be to look after the body. Sometimes it will be to do some more meditation or to go on a walk. Sometimes it might be to listen to a Dhamma talk or follow some guided meditation if you're not quite sure how to meditate alone. Um, but the main thing that you're doing is completely correct to try and accept all the feelings that arise with kindness. That's basically what it's all about, yeah? So it's not so much about what we feel or what we do, or um, you know, even in meditation, whether it's a so-called good one or a bad one. The difference is the way we relate to what's happening. You know, there are people who have meditations and you think, gosh, what are they complaining about? You know, apparently there was someone who came to Ajahn Brahm once and said, I'm really fed up today because I had second jhana and I can't get into the third. And Ajahn Brahm just had to laugh. You know, he's like, that can't be a jhana because there's no way you'd be feeling grumpy in the second jhana. You know, and I know how much happiness can come even, you know, long before the first jhana. You can be extremely contented and blissed out for hours. So, yeah, it's really not about how far you go. It's, it's about um, how you're appreciating and valuing and being kind to what arises. So just relax with that. And um, six hours is not that long. I mean, if you have to eat during that time, that takes some time. So maybe slow down a bit, you know, make something really nice. Cut things carefully, put extra mindfulness into how you prepare the food or extra mindfulness into your walk, you know, do some slow walking meditation. Just see if you can experience the spaciousness and the beauty of that space. Another thing that can be helpful is to um, remember the business that went before and to conjure up a feeling of gratefulness that now you don't have to do that busyness. <laughs> yeah. This is loosely related to what the Buddha teaches in the uh, Chula Sunyata Sutta. It's the perception of emptiness. And he's saying that, you know, you go to the forest and the way to develop the perception of emptiness is to recognize that the forest is empty of the city. Yeah. So you're looking at what it's empty of. You're looking at the distractions and the hassle that's dropped away. So now, you know, you're hopefully not having to go to work. So, oh, this is wonderful. I've got the whole day on my own and uh, this space is free from traffic and cities and noise so recognize what's not there recognize the the suffering that's fallen away and that will also help you appreciate what is there oh my goodness it's nearly nine o'clock i'm probably answering these questions too much information Okay, so let me just clarify this one, because someone said that they understood I said that the Brahma Viharas were the antidotes to various hindrances, but there were four Brahma Viharas and five hindrances, <laughs> so which match up? So yeah, it's not that the hindrances and the Brahma Viharas entirely match up, and I don't think that's what I meant to say. Um, but what I was saying in the beginning of my sessions, at the beginning of these evening sessions, is that... Um, there were five hindrances and I'm going to try and cover some themes which will relate to one or the other of these hindrances, roughly speaking. Um, but sometimes there are many different things that work for one hindrance or there can be one antidote that works for all the hindrances. For example, contentment is something that works for pretty much all of the hindrances, right? Because if you content, you don't have so many desires. If you content, it undermines ill will. Why should you be upset with something if you're actually contented with it? You can even be content with being depressed. And if you're content with depression, what happens to the depression? You can't really call it depression anymore. So in this way, you know, there are different um, antidotes, but some are good for all the hindrances. And some have a special quality. So metta, for example, is the classic antidote to ill will. It's particularly powerful as an antidote to ill will. Um, the Brahma Vihara of compassion is the antidote to, um, hmm, like to cruelty, to violence, but also to 
pity as well. You know, this they call it the near enemy of compassion. You know, when you look at somebody, you think, oh, poor thing. It looks similar to compassion, but it's actually not because you're actually looking down on somebody um, and almost distancing yourself from their suffering. So compassion can be the antidote, obviously, to cruelty, to harming, to violence, but also to pity. Um, and then mudita, joy, is the classic antidote to things like jealousy and envy, a feeling of lack. And I've started to feel that the um, mudita to oneself is also a really good antidote to that because it bestows a sense of gratitude. You know, when we have like, when we're able to rejoice in our own goodness or in the things that we have in our life that are going well, then we're more grateful for those. And we're less likely to look at other people and say, hmm, they've got something I haven't got because you appreciate what you do have. So this is great because uh, envy, jealousy are really um, psychologically harmful qualities to have. You know, they always give us this sense of lacking something and never being quite good enough. And then the equanimity is, a, is it an antidote? It's more of a result, I would say, of the other hindrances being, you know, um, in abeyance. Equanimity is a kind of very cool and um, even looking on, looking on at experience without being pulled into it. It has a lot of wisdom imbued within it. So it's able to feel compassion, feel metta, feel even joy for others, but also recognize that there's only so much you can do to alleviate the suffering. And ultimately people will have to um, experience the results of their actions, the results of their intentions. So it's not devoid of metta and compassion. It actually um, incorporates those within it. It's more of a um, the wisdom aspect is involved and there's a certain amount of um, perspective that equanimity can bring. So that's a little bit about the four Brahma Viharas and um, I don't have really any time left, but as far as the five hindrances go, I mean, just try with different antidotes. Contentment's a good one, as I say. Okay, someone else is saying that the meditation becomes dull and you spend a lot of time in dullness. Can I give some suggestions? You could try some more walking meditation. If you are tired, you could sleep. If not, I would say don't worry about it too much because over time the mind does wake up, especially if you learn to go through it. I've actually had retreats where I've been through it for like a couple of weeks. Of course, I have three long retreats, so I have the time for that. But at some point, it's amazing if you can stay still with it. When the mind emerges from that dullness and sleepiness, the mind is still even. It's actually still. And then it starts to fill up with good stuff all on its own. Whereas if you fight it, what happens is you come out of the sleepiness and you go straight into a kind of restlessness. So don't worry too much about it. But if it is really annoying you and you feel you're wasting time, then try to do some um, more walking meditation or try to sit for shorter periods. You know, perhaps if you're getting sleepy, say after 20 minutes, um, decide, OK, I'll stop myself after 20 minutes. I'll come out. I'll open my eyes. Maybe again, change, do some walking meditation or sit again after that. Yeah. One thing that was happening in my rains retreat was that I was getting into some meditation and then at some point after my mind was still, the thoughts would come back in and it was like, huh, <laughs> what's happening? And I worked out it was happening at around a similar time in every session. And so Ajahn Brahm said, just program yourself that you'll open your eyes just very quickly at that point. So I'll tell myself in the beginning, after such and such time, I'll open my eyes. After such and such time, I'll open my eyes. Program the mindfulness. And then I would. And then that would cut that circuit. Because it's like the brain gets into like a cycle and starts repeating itself. So you can experiment, but please don't um, fight it and try not to develop aversion to it. That's the main thing. And um, it is five past nine. So unfortunately, I think I'm going to have to let most of these go. I haven't even read most of them because there's so many coming in. Um, <laughs> oh. 
uh, let me just see if there's anything that looks sort of urgent because I don't want to keep everybody. Um, so someone's asking for a good source for reading the suttas. I'll just show you the book that I was looking at this evening because it's a beautiful book, especially for people who want to get into the suttas in a way that feels very practical and digestible. And it's this book by Bhikkhu Bodhi called Social and Communal Harmony. And he's taken various suttas on themes related to harmony. So there's themes on personal training, themes on um, living in harmony, themes on loving kindness, friendship, anger, all kinds of things in different chapters with a little explanation at the beginning of each. So it's only a small book. And I would say this is a great place to start if you haven't read any suttas before. There's another anthology called um, In the Buddha's Words, and that's also by Bhikkhu Bodhi, which is also great. There's also online suttas, um, like Sutta Central, where you can find uh, all the suttas, but I personally find that site a little confusing. And personally, I prefer Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation generally, um, but Sutta Central translations are often based on this and then adapted slightly. So, and some people would prefer those. So that's Sutta, S-U-T-T-A, Central. And that's all online for free. Okay, I'm just scanning it quickly. Uh, okay, so someone's saying that when they focus on the breath, they get anxious, but if they focus on something else, the breath relaxes. Okay, so that to me sounds like that you're moving on to the breath too soon and that there's not enough relaxation in the mind first. So I would focus on foundations, really relaxing the body and the mind first so that when the breath arises, it arises naturally at a time when the mind is subtle and relaxed enough to allow it to come in without it disturbing the mind too much. You might notice in the beginning when the breath comes in that there's a slight disturbance, especially if you're enjoying silence and peace. And sometimes you're a little bit reluctant to go onto the breath because of that. But if your mind's ready for that breath, you'll find that that coarseness doesn't last too long and it starts to um, settle and relax on its own. If the anxiety is increasing with the breath, I would say prepare your mind a little bit more first. And I am going through this quite quickly, so there might be a lot more I could say on that, but I'm just trying to give you something because time is short. Okay, and lastly, I'll, I'll end on this one so that you can go to bed. Um, someone's saying that they feel some resistance in learning more about the theory. Is this my ego or laziness? Am I getting annoyed because I don't understand it? A lot of things don't enter my heart or head. I like simple things like love and kindness. These things I understand with my heart. Would it be helpful to study the Dhamma anyway? Or can I learn also by just feeling the body, practicing awareness and being here now? That's a great question. And Ajahn um, Cha, he used to say, read the book of your heart. So actually Ajahn Brahm said that to me as well on my first Rains retreat in Perth. I had studied quite a bit, but not excessively. Um, you know, not to be like a Pali scholar. But I said to him, are there any books I should read? And he said, read the book of your heart. So I actually think, especially if you're, you know, if this is your first retreat or you haven't done a lot of retreats, then it's great to just go with the emotional understanding of the practice because you're getting a lot of input from Ajahn Brahm and also a little bit from me. And that's more than enough. And you don't have to let it all enter your head or heart. I mean, it can't actually. When we're having like four and a half hours a day of input. There's no way anyone can absorb all that. We're just giving it out that way because there are people of all different, um, what's the word, um, inclinations here, all different levels of understanding. And some people will be more intellectually inclined. Some people will be more like you, sort of more interested in understanding love and kindness and, and um, the freedom that can come through the practice, the freedom of heart. So don't worry about it and don't get constipated by trying to take it all in. Let it come and let it flow out and whatever you need will come up in your practice at the right time. 
So after the retreat, it's a different thing. After the retreat, you might feel inclined to go and have a look into those suttas. And hopefully, if you have some experience of meditation, you'll be able to understand them much better than you would have done before. That's the best way, I think. The practice and the theory should go together. Yeah. Okay, so whichever questions are really urgent and important, I'm sure we'll see them again tomorrow. So please feel free to put them to Ajahn Brahm or put them to me. But sometimes questions are answered simply through practice, you know, and by tomorrow you may have entirely different questions to ask. So I wish you a very lovely evening. And um, if you do still have time, uh, enjoy your practice, you know, whether that's seated, walking, lying down, semi-reclined, however it is for you, or just taking care of your body and your heart. So good night, everyone. Take care. See you tomorrow.